but like to acknowledge that Macedon Ranger Shire is on Dja Dja Wurrung, Tungurung and Wurundjeri country, and to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who might be joining us today. So my name's Anna Nicholson, I'm the health broker at Macedon Ranger Shire Council with an initiative called Healthy Heart of Victoria. So you might know various amounts about that. I'll just give a very brief background. It's a state funded initiative and it's aimed at improving health outcomes across the whole of Rodden Campassie region. So there are six participating local governments of which Macedon Rangers is one. And the active living census is one of three key components of Healthy Heart. Uh, so coming to this slide here, the model shows that the idea is that we need all three components um, of the Healthy Heart Initiative in order to achieve meaningful and sustainable change in chronic disease. So part of that component is having data from the Active Living Census and from other sources and really using that data as an evidence base to inform our planning and our decision making. Uh, we also have funding for infrastructure and for activities that help to get more people more active more often. So really thinking about putting the right things in the right places, planning our environments to encourage physical activity and putting the programs and facilities in places to also encourage healthy eating and uh, other, other actions we know are really important to reduce chronic disease. Uh, and there's also the brokers. So that's my position. There are six of us across Lod and Camp Aspey. And our work is to really work across council to help people to embed wellbeing in decision making. So today's session is the first of our lunchtime seminars on the Active Living Census. And it's probably the most technical, I guess. It's really starting off with a bit of background about the census, how it was conducted, why it was conducted, how the data has been analysed and reported. And we'll go into some tips for reporting the data, for interpreting the data, sorry, as well. And I'm hoping that it puts everyone in a really good position to be able to understand what's in the reports and also to know some of the limitations around using the data as well. I'm always here as a touching, you know, as a sounding board. So I really welcome any questions outside of this session. Really want people to be able to get the most out of this great resource. All right, I'm going to play this video now. It's been developed, um, I guess, so that we can share information about the census with a really broad audience. So this will go up on our webpage soon. Um, it provides a little bit of background to the census and Healthy Heart uh, and explains the reports that are available as well. It is a bit of a lengthy video. It goes for just over five minutes. So feel free to get into your lunch, settle back. We'll watch that and then we'll come back and have a conversation. In 2019, the Active Living Census was sent to households in the Lodden Camp Aspie region, the heart of Oops, sorry, me fiddling with the settings. Let me go again. In 2019, the Active Living Census was sent to households in the Lodden Camp Aspie region, part of Victoria. The region has a population of around 230,000 people and covers six local government areas. The City of Greater Bendigo, Camp Aspey, Central Goldfields, Lodden, Macedon Ranges and Mount Alexander Shires. The purpose of the Active Living Census was to improve our understanding of the health and wellbeing of people living in the Lodden Camp Aspey region. We wanted to find out more about people's physical activity levels, what their health is like and what we can do to help improve health outcomes in our communities. The information for the Active Living Census will help local government and other organisations ensure that the right types of facilities and programs are in the right places, with the aim to get more people more active more often. It will also provide relevant and reliable data to help track changes over time. The data will support local organisations and groups to advocate for the health and wellbeing needs of their communities, as well as help obtain funding to create better health outcomes and help drive positive change across the region. The Active Living Census was funded by the Healthy Heart of Victoria initiative and project managed by Healthy Greater Bendigo in collaboration with the Social Research Centre. Healthy Heart of Victoria aims to improve the health and wellbeing of residents in the Lodden Camp Aspey region. The initiative was established to support people of all ages to be healthier, to eat well, and to be more active. 
Healthy Heart of Victoria is using the findings from the Active Living Census to make small additions and changes to public outdoor places so that they become safer, inclusive, accessible and more active. There are many ways the data from the Active Living Census can be used. These include to measure physical activity, recreation and health behaviours, to track how these behaviours change over time, to better understand community needs, putting the right facilities and programs in the right places, to better target our resources to where the need is greatest, to provide the community with data they can rely on when planning and evaluating programs and when applying for funding, and to attract research to the region. The 2019 Active Living Census was based on a similar census undertaken by the City of Greater Bendigo in 2014. The 2019 survey included new questions that address new needs and priorities. Alongside findings about people's physical activity levels, the activities they participate in and where they do these, we wanted to understand the barriers people faced and what local improvements would support more people to be more active. To find out more about the respondents' health, we asked, how many serves of fruit and vegetables they had each day, how much water, sugary drink and alcohol they consumed, did they smoke, and if they gambled, did they think it was a problem? A hard copy of the Active Living Census was delivered to households in the Lodden Campaspe region through Australia Post. Additional booklets were left on counters in post offices, at local council offices, libraries and at other community places. It was also available to complete online. A letter enclosed with a hard copy explained the purpose of the survey and gave information on how to complete the survey online. Online completion was encouraged where possible and a hotline was provided for any questions. Parents and guardians were invited to complete the survey for children aged between 3 and 17, or they could consent for those over 16 to complete it themselves. The Active Living Census was promoted on television, radio, in newspapers, newsletters, online and through social media. A series of lucky prize draws were conducted to encourage people to take part. Prizes included vouchers for local supermarkets and sports stores and a bike as the major prize. Survey responses were received from May 20 to June 16 in 2019. Nearly 25,000 individual responses were received across the region, which is around 11% of the population. This makes the 2019 Active Living Census one of the largest surveys ever conducted in the region. The data collection analysis and reporting was undertaken by the Social Research Centre with support from Healthy Greater Bendigo. Two different styles of report have been prepared for the Lodden Campaspe region and for each of the six participating local government areas. The selected findings report provides a summary of the main findings using colourful graphs and images. This is the best report to use to learn about the key findings on health and physical activity in each local area. The selected findings report includes a snapshot of information broken down by community members, different characteristics and experiences, such as age, gender and disability. The top line report provides detailed information and results tables for every topic included in the Active Living Census. This report includes a copy of the survey questions, information on how many people answered each question, how the results were analysed, how they differed across the community, and on testing for statistical significance of differences presented. When comparing the breakdown of people who responded to the survey with the whole community, the survey group had slightly more females, older residents, and people with a university degree. We have used a statistical technique called weighting so that the survey results better reflect the whole community. Weighting adjusts the characteristics of the survey group so that it matches the age, education, gender and country of birth of the whole community. Nearly 25,000 individual responses to the 2019 Active Living Census were received across the region, which is around 11% of the population. It makes the 2019 Active Living Census one of the largest surveys ever undertaken in our region. No other region in Australia has this type of data at this level of detail. There are many ways the data from the Active Living Census can be used and we encourage you to access the report most suitable to your needs. Both the selected findings and top line reports for each of the six local government areas can be accessed on the relevant council websites. The Lodden Campaspe Region reports can be found on the Lodden Campaspe Regional Partnership page on the Regional Development Victoria website. If you have any questions, then please email us at hhv at bendigo.vic.gov.au.
All right, okay, thank you for that. So uh, this is what the census booklet looks like. Um, so they went out May to June last year. Hard copies distributed to every household in the region. There were some questions that kicked off that were at a household level. So we only asked these questions once and there was response, just one response for the household. And then it broke down into questions that were for individuals within the household as well. So here's the range of questions that were asked. So these health and wellbeing questions um, were really, I guess, what we consider the key outcomes that are reported in the survey, as well as those on recreation and active living. The demographics in the left-hand column, we actually have all of the outcomes um, cross-tabulated, so reported at the level of each of those demographics. So we can find out, for example, did vegetable consumption vary based on level of education or whether someone was born in Australia or not? So that gives us a really detailed level of information that we've really never had before so that we can better target our programs and planning. Uh, I won't dwell on this. We've sort of gone into that through the video itself. I guess just to point out that the survey was open for longer than was intended. It occurred at a little bit of a tricky time last year. It was coming into winter, so there were issues with some of the surveys getting a bit wet in mailboxes. Um, there was a bit more of a delayed arrival in within households than we expected. So some more rural uh, households received the survey a little bit late and some not at all. So these were issues, I guess, that we heard about through that implementation period. Um, and we attempted to overcome them through making copies of the survey available uh, in councils, libraries, other sites as well, and promoting the fact that they were available. But I guess just to bear in mind, although it was a household survey, there were some issues with the distribution. Uh, so as was explained in the video, just over, sorry, just under 25,000 responses all up across Lord and Campaspe, which is 11% of the population. So it's low for what you might call a census, but it's very high in terms of a council run survey. So it's still a phenomenal number of responses. Um, and I guess participation among a really broad cross section of the community, which is incredibly valuable. Uh, you can see that in Macedon Ranges, the response rate was a little bit lower. It's difficult to say exactly why that was the case. Um, we know that the marketing campaign, for example, didn't reach the southernmost part of our shire. And that's just because the media market, the Bendigo media market, only extends just south of Kyneton uh, and Gisborne and some of our more southern towns are actually part of the metropolitan Melbourne media market. So that may have, uh, you know, that may have affected participation in the, in the more southern parts of our shire. There were also different strategies for local engagement used um, by each of the health brokers and that probably also played a part. We learned, for example, that it was really important to um, have that close relationship and contact with the post offices, uh, which is not something that we sort of learnt about until later in the fact. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit more depth about who took part in the survey now, and I guess some of the things to bear in mind as limitations of our, of our data. Um, so what these next slides show are our sample is in the blue bars. And the population, so what we were aiming to get, is in the green bars. So all of those green bars will add up to 100%, as will the blue bars. So you can see that where they're close to each other, we've matched pretty well what the actual population is. And where there's a bit of a gap, um, there was a difference in our sample compared to the population. So what I'll point out here, sorry, my dog is um, upset in the background. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, Macedon would end, you can see that there was a real over-representation. So we had more people from that area take part in the survey than, um, than what we predict based on the proportion of people from those areas living in the Shire. And we had an under-representation in Riddles and in Romsey. So I guess that sort of shows us that we did pretty well in our biggest towns um, and probably in the more affluent areas of the Shire as well. And we did less well in getting participation in some of the smaller areas. Uh, so this slide here, it's a busy slide, I'm sorry. I'll talk you through it. So these are the variables that the data is weighted by. So this is where um, 
weighting kind of adjusts the averages so that they reflect the representation of the of people within the population. Um, so I'll give you an example. So we know that males and females are roughly 50% of our population. Um, what we got in our survey was actually 56% participation by females and 44% by males. So when the data is weighted, it brings it back so that it's roughly 50-50 contributing to the average. So that means that our results better reflect the actual population. So our data is weighted on several variables, on gender, on age by education, so a combination of these two uh, variables here, and also on whether or not someone was born in Australia or born overseas. And the data, the, the sort of benchmarking data is taken from the census. So the company that did this for us has sort of massaged our data to make it match um, what we would expect to see based on the census. So this means that our results are representative of the general population. Of course, there's never any perfect sample. Um, there are other things that affect who takes part and therefore what your responses look like, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more depth. Um, I guess the main thing to point out here, the biggest, you know, the area that weighting has had the biggest impact on is level of education. So in our sample, we had um, roughly 50-50, less than bachelor and bachelor and higher. Whereas we know in Mass and Ranger Shire, it's more like 75% less than bachelor and 25% bachelor or higher. So that education variable um, is, is the one where we were least representative, but it's been addressed in the weighting process. Here are some other social characteristics. So we haven't weighted on these factors. These are just interesting things to bear in mind, I guess, that again, help to explain how well our sample reflects the population. And you can see we've done pretty well on a lot of these um, outcomes. So on food security, on speaking language other than English, on needing help with daily activities, on identifying as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, our sample fairly well matched what you would expect to see from the census. Sorry, actually speaking language other than English, um, we do have a, a much lower percentage of people uh, who speak a language other than English who took part in our survey. Um, again, not so surprising given it was a, you know, a written um, survey. We didn't have um, support from translators offered or that real um, local face-to-face -face engagement that could have helped to boost that. The one where we have the biggest difference here is holding a concession card. So we have a real over-representation of people who um, have a concession card. That's maybe because we also had higher participation among older adults and retirees who maybe are on the aged pension. Um, but I mean, I think it's a really positive thing that we've been able to reach people who need that financial assistance with our survey. Um, sometimes it can be you know, really challenging getting feedback across a broad cross section of the population. So I think we've done pretty well across a lot of those different characteristics. Um, this one is, I guess, uh, useful for people who are interested in comparing some population and health benchmarks in our survey based on what we know from more recent population health surveys. So, um, this is a little bit different to interpret for a couple of reasons. Um, the Vic Population Health Survey for most of the Rangers was most recently considered in 2017, so that's two years before our survey. So it's possible that the differences in um, some of these health behaviours because of the time, it's possible that the difference exists because um, you know, because of the way we ask the question or because ours is framed as an active living census. Um, it, it's difficult to say exactly why those differences exist. I guess the key thing to point out here is that we're pretty well on the money um, for a lot of these different health behaviours, which is encouraging. Um, the areas where there are some differences are in um, current smoking. So we have fewer smokers participate in our survey than what you would expect from our population. Um, again, that's not so surprising. It's often you know, really difficult in population health research to, um, you know, to recruit and to survey smokers. That's just something, a pattern that we see frequently. Um, 
So we're probably underrepresented smokers. There's also a difference in whether or not people have met vegetable consumption guidelines. Uh, that's a little bit separate. I mean, it's extremely different. Um, I guess the main take home from here, our survey is particularly useful because we can drill down below a shire level. So the big population health survey has these really standardised ways that they ask questions. They do it the same easy time, they go back to the population. It's a very um, tried and tested way of collecting this data and it allows them to compare year on year changes in outcomes. Our survey is more of a one-off. Um, it may be repeated in the future, but the methods are not to that same kind of um, rigorous standard as the big population. So what I would recommend is if you're wanting to use, you know, if you're wanting to cite a prevalence of something, so how many people meet veg consumption guidelines or meat fruit consumption guidelines, it's really valuable to use the population survey, particularly if you want to track changes. Where our results are particularly useful. Uh, is to drill down and see, well, what's the difference across towns within our shire and people within our community? So that sort of data we're not able to get from the big population. So Anna? Yeah, hi. There's just a lot of interference. I'm not sure if anyone else is hearing it. I'm hearing it. Has everyone, everyone got their, their microphone on mute there? If not, if we could just get you to pop that on mute and we'll keep going. Cool. Perfect, thank you. All right. Sorry, this is always a tricky part of the survey to kind of explain and we can have a bit of a conversation around that in more in more depth. Um, I guess this benchmarking helps us to understand um, helps us understand how well we did, I guess, in getting a really broad participation of the community. Um, and in having data that we feel really confident in reporting at a population level. Um, these are the two reports that are available for your use. The top line report here is the one that has that really detailed information that breaks it down, all of our health outcomes by all of those demographic characteristics that we spoke about. So it drills down beyond gender and age and it provides detailed information for health outcomes, health behaviours based on your social circumstances, your financial circumstances, and clustering with other health behaviours as well. So a lot of really detailed, in-depth information. The selected findings reports, they are sort of more colourful infographic style reports. It has a page, a double page spreadsheet on each town within the Shire. So you can go straight to see the data for Kyneton or Lansfield, Romsey. Um, and it also gives some population sheets as well. So if, you're, if you work particularly with children or with adolescents, you can look for the data for that population group summarised again uh, in a double page spread. So I think that's a really good starting point. Um, and also I think what will be most user friendly for members of the community. The top line report is probably more useful for your data nerds like me. So we're interested in that little bit more um, detailed information and some of that background information on testing for statistical significance. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, not too much detail. I know it's, a, it's something that makes people's eyes glaze over. All right, I'm going to go through some tips for using the data. We'll go through this section and then we can have a general conversation and I'll, I'll open it up for, for your questions. Um, what I would recommend, because there's so much information in here, and you can see on the slide here in this detailed report, over 160 pages of data and of summaries of that data. So that's a lot if you're looking for something specific. So what I recommend, start as a table of contents um, and identify those parts you can flick straight through. So flick straight to to get the information that you need. Similarly, in the selected findings report, there's this summary page that tells you on each of the sections, um, you know, where you can find that information. A really good first step. All right. Um, another thing, 
as someone with a research background, I'm always interested in how many people actually answered this question. So this is really important because obviously the bigger the sample size, the closer you get to a more accurate and reliable answer. So you sort of start off with this really broad spread and the more and more people you ask, um, the more you kind of get closer to the average, I guess. So in our top line report, so that's the really detailed report, on this top row here, it will tell you the total sample. And there's a column here for the unweighted base. So that's the number of people in each of these categories that answered that question. So you can see that the total sample might have been over 3,000. As soon as we start to look at the results for some of those smaller groups, the numbers get a little bit smaller, but they're still well over 100. We've been able to conduct tests for statistical significance, and we're pretty, we're pretty comfortable reporting the data at that level. Um, where only a small number of people have answered a question, as I mentioned, there's just a lot of fuzziness around the estimate. So I'd just be really cautious. If ever you see an asterisk, for example, that means that fewer than 30 people have responded to the question. And with that really small sample, you just be really cautious about um, putting too much weight or emphasis on that result or comparing it to other results within the report. So just, um, I always think that's a good first step. How many people answer this question? Do you feel comfortable, um, I guess, using that sample to represent the community? So significance testing has been conducted. It's, um, it's reported in the top line report, and that's um, where these coloured boxes come into play. So where a cell is coloured blue, it means that, that that particular outcome is significantly lower than the ones that are coloured purple. So the categories are compared to each other. Um, so for example, in the slide there, you can see that males were significantly more likely than females to be overweight. So 45% 40, of males versus 29% of females. So those results there are compared to each other within that category. Um, so that test for statistical significance, there's a little figure over here to the left, which I won't go into too much depth, but essentially what it means is it kind of takes into account all of that fuzziness around the estimate and it considers are they far apart enough that we can say with confidence that the difference is not just due to chance. That's really important because we don't want to make too much of a difference um, that, you know, we don't, we don't want to target community members um, with an intervention unless we see that it's really kind of meaningful and that um, there's a real, you know, that we're pretty confident that there's something going on within that community group that we want to better understand and better address. Um, I guess the main take home from this is don't make too much from small differences. So um, looking at this slide here, for example, we can see, um, I might just point out identification as LGBTQIA+. The difference in the proportion of people who are overweight who identify as being LGBTI or not, although there's a difference in those numbers, when we do that test for statistical significance, uh, they're not far apart enough. There's too much fuzziness around the estimates to say that it's a real and meaningful difference. So I think, you know, whether or not this is useful to you really depends on how you're going to use the data. Um, if you're using it for a grant or for some sort of research report or you're summarising all of the evidence, I would really encourage you to have a look at and interrogate um, in a bit more depth some of the, um, you know, I guess the significance between the differences or get in touch with me to have a chat about it. I'm really happy to talk this through. Um, some other tips for using the data. Consider health equity. So are some community members worse off? And then, you know, thinking about, well, what are the unique barriers and how can we better address their needs? I think this is, it comes into that sort of evaluative thinking and planning and that strategic work that we all want to be doing more of. So it's not just, for example, saying, okay, well, 
36, 37% of people within our shire are overweight. We're drilling down in, well, is that a problem for some community members more than others? And we can see based on this table here, um, that overweight and obesity, more of an issue for men than for women, um, particularly that sort of middle-aged group of men in some areas within our shire more than others. So in Kyneton, Riddles and Romsey, more than in Masset and Woodend. Um, for people with a lower education or those who are less financially secure, those who are only just getting along in life, compared to those who aren't. Um, obesity, more of an issue for people with fair or poor health than those with really good health. And similarly, if you have low life satisfaction, so if you have poor mental well-being, obesity is a bigger problem as well. Significantly higher rates of obesity among people with poor mental health. So looking down the tables for some of these differences really helps that targeted intervention. It helps in our planning and making sure we're putting the right programs in the right places. And similarly with our infrastructure, making sure we're building the right things in the right places when it comes to improving physical activity. If you're planning programs, it can also be useful to consider clustering with other health behaviours. So rather than, for example, just targeting um, an obesity prevention program, you might be also looking at, well, I can see here that obesity exists together with low physical activity um, among people who are ex-smokers and with high rates of alcohol consumption and binge drinking. So maybe there's some sort of target, you know, sort of packaged intervention or considering some of those other health behaviours together um, in a more comprehensive kind of approach. And also, I guess, help you to understand um, how these behaviours occur together. Important to understand that it's not saying that one thing causes another. So it's not, the data's not saying that low physical activity causes the obesity. There's no time, um, you know, there's no time interval with this data. It's just saying that they're existing together, that we're measuring the same things together. Good to ask the question of yourself as well, is what this report is showing, does that fit with what you know from elsewhere? Does it fit with what you know from other bits of evidence or population health research? And that can kind of give you confidence in the data. Um, and it, it might also, I guess, help you to um, frame some questions that you want addressed that will help you to understand why that behaviour is existing. All right, um, I'm almost through. Briefly on interpreting the results. So the census tells heaps of information about the health and wellbeing of our communities. There's so much data in there. It's a really rich resource. But we want to consider it along with other data sets. So together with our understanding of other influences on the built environment, the natural environment, our local economy. Um, so what's, what's existing at the social and community level? And that's really important, I guess, for that sort of more holistic view of understanding our community um, and of really, I guess, packaging up our response um, to, to identified needs. So as explained in the video, data can be used for a whole range of reasons. And I'd be interested to hear from you about, I guess, how you'd like to use the data and what kind of support you might need as well to be able to um, find, you know, locate the right information and interpret it as well. So we hope that it will help everyone to better understand health behaviours at a local level, particularly how those health behaviours vary in different towns within our Shire and for different community members. Um, we really hope that it can be used for evidence-based planning of infrastructure, putting the right things in the right places. And certainly based on the City of Greater Bendigo experience in 2014, they found the data incredibly useful for putting a bit of extra weight into their funding applications, that when they could provide this localised evidence, this really rigorous localised evidence on exactly why they were putting forward a certain proposal, um, in that period they were able to attract more funding than they had before. Whether or not it was just the census or they had other things going on, who knows. Um, but certainly really good local data is just gold for attracting funding to the region 
and also for attracting further research to kind of unpack some of these findings um, and to understand and support our community.